I originally studied um, construction management and I worked in the industry for for about three years before making the move from the built environment to, to the visual art space. Um, but I think being in the construction industry uh, triggered a lot of, um, or was a, was, a, was a very critical, uh, played a critical role in me deciding to move from the one industry to the other because um, the construction industry is generally, um, you know, most of the people that work in the construction industry are from the rural areas. They, they're from outside of the urban or township areas. They're from the rural areas. And so I grew up in a township environment. Um, but, you know, whenever we had conversations with mostly the men in, in the space, um, they would be very specific about cultural dynamics and the environments, the landscapes in the rural areas. And I got drawn to, to that lifestyle um, because I didn't grow up in that lifestyle. And usually in a, in, a, in a traditional Zulu household, you'll have people living in the urban spaces or the townships, but they'll still have a rural or a home or countryside that they go home to, which they call home. I, I didn't have that. So it, it was interesting for me to see um, how the, the culture and identity shift shifted when they moved or navigated from the one space, which is home, uh, to the urban space, which is, you know, the city and the town. Um, so at that time, I bought a camera just, you know, as a hobby. And what I decided to do is then is go home whenever they went home to the countryside is go with them so that I would photograph this landscape and these this livestock that they spoke of and and just look at the different dynamics that exist within you know, the two worlds and how they then position themselves um, among or between these two worlds. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's where it started being, um, it started a conversation of identity within myself uh, um, from from a, a historical point of view. What is what is the concept of home mean? Um, because I, you, you, I mean, as, as a Zuri girl, the concept of home is strongly rooted to the ground, it's strongly rooted to the soil. It's, it's, it's because of that relationship with, with the physical world and the spiritual world. So if I didn't have a home to go to uh, that is linked to my ancestors and where they were buried, then, you know, there's a lot of questions that come out of that. And so I think in the process of trying to understand that identity, um, you know, I, I got drawn more and more to using the medium of photography because I guess that's what I had. A camera is what I had. And I think the conversation and the questions that I have that I had internally were then being answered um, by, by using the camera to engage with the subject and to confront these questions and confront these different different spaces. So so I think yeah, that's that's basically how I started photography. It's, it was purely from just an interest point of view. I wasn't drawn to photography as a medium itself. I was more drawn into the subject or, or the topic of culture and identity and spirituality. And so uh, photography then became the tool at which I engaged with that particular topic. And then that's basically how everything else started. You know, I eventually joined the DCP about a year after leaving the industry. Um, and then obviously, the, the, again, those concepts of po um, politics, uh, societal topics and cultural and all those different dynamics then became something that I could sort of put together and, you know, I could finally have, or I could finally define or have a proper understanding of what exactly I, I, I was trying to achieve. And yeah, so that journey of, of continuously unpacking the topics of culture spirituality, identity have continued to be the main themes in the work that I do. Um, and it's mainly through photography. I do do a bit of video, but it's mainly through the medium of photography. Um, I think mine's not as um, nice and romantic a <laughs> story. I think that for me, it was uh, at a pretty young age, I always knew that I was going to get into something in the arts. I tried to fight it. <laughs> um, but <laughs> it didn't happen um, and I, I was, it was going to happen and it, it was inevitable because my parents are both reasonably creative inclined 
um, although follow very traditional, uh, have very traditional work life, but mm -hmm. their passions, like my dad became a photographer late in life, and then my mom's always been a singer in the bands all her life, but then followed normal day jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then, I yeah, I, I just knew that it was what I was wanting to do, wanted to do. I was a bit unsure until I got into university and then pretty much my first month of studying, I was like, I'm home. This is exactly where I need to be. It's fit. Um, so that was kind of just initially how I got into it. And then kind of, you, am I going to go, do you want me to talk about how conceptually, how I got into where I went conceptually? Is that? Yes, you? Do. Yeah? Okay. Um, so for most of my bodies of works I've ever made so far, it's very interesting. <laughs> I've uh, grappled with this idea of the uh, in environment. I've touched on issues of home and urban life and urban spaces. Um, but I don't know how much this helps you again because this is a bit of a departure. <laughs> anyway, just so you got a bit of a background and context. Yeah. Um, and I think that I was always my, my first major body of work was about the space between suburban and urban spaces and kind of how we navigate through those spaces and the relationships um, they have. And then it also dealt with some issues of uh, suburbia and um, the middle class and a little bit of whiteness actually, but very, very basically. And then my second, I moved on to kind of looking at transients within urban spaces. And that was uh, where that dead hanging bird that you guys have selected for the Turban Art, art Fair, that work mm -hmm. came out of that. Um, kind of just looking at how spaces that are so familiar decay and, but also are reborn. I've dealt a lot with um, construction sites and construction materials and um, mm. both physically with relationship with my paper sculptures um, and then my last most recent body of work I dealt with the idea of home but focusing again still urban space but looking at kind of property and um, how we have uh, we look at how the concept of home has changed into something that's an investment rather than a place of sanctuary kind of thing. We've monetized it. Mm. But yeah, still, I still, I just can't leave the urban, I suppose that's just because that's my environment and where I'm, I'm inspired from. I don't know. That was like super general, super broad overview of kind of my shift of thinking. And then this new work, um, uh, look, um focusing on kind of taking an idea or a feeling often or an image and especially the work that you guys have selected was very inspired by again my environment in the urban space and kind of taking those moments and distilling it down into and reordering it and reorganizing it into color and texture and rhythm and movement so yeah Um, yeah, so paper pretty much has been my primary medium for the last seven, eight years now or something like that. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with it um, because it's kind of one of the only mediums that first of all transitions so seamlessly between 2D and 3D. Um, and also, but my ma one of the major reasons that I, that I love it so much is um, the fact that it's kind of the um, so commonplace and mm. mundane and um, it's also one of the most consumable commodities of our time which mm. is like nuts it's everywhere and so it's quite a familiar medium um, and it's and because we're where we use it from such a young age it's kind of also the idea of creating creating on a piece of paper or turning into a paper airplane or 
that's that kind of embedded in us, in us from a tiny age. It's, it's like a means to something magical, a magical world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of, I still have that. <laughs> Every time I like, make something new or cut it out or make a sculpture, I just think that that's uh, been so important why I've stuck with it for so long. I think that a lot of the, like my pristine wife works, um, I've used it to kind of symbolize this idea of fragility and pureness and kind of, um, that's been really important, especially when I was dealt with ideas of um, transience and, um, and uh, yeah, the fact that was very commonplace, I think was also really important. Now, the, so I've, for about six years, I worked with only white paper, mm. and that was important. Partly, it was important conceptually for certain bodies of work, but mainly I battled to do the shift to color because paper can be very crafty depending on how you work with it. So, introducing color could just look like someone's Pinterest. <laughs> Board and I suppose, but that's what's also what, so what's interesting about paper is it grapples the line between art and craft because paper is traditionally not an art medium, it's always just been used as a substrate for an artist to do a drawing on or print an image on. And so, mm -hmm. take making that shift and putting the focus on the medium has been really important. And that's kind of one of my major things with this new body of work as well is that it's like. For me, it could be made out of anything else. And that's why it's really important that you have to see all the ripped edges of the page. And it's the only medium that will really give you that fluidity and movement and structure, which is quite important. Um, but the shift uh, happened a lot because I was also, I've been craving some color in my life. As David David Hockney said. <laughs> um, I know, I did. I've been, I just, I've had like, three shows of just pretty much all white and everybody keeps asking me about white color and honestly I really wanted to use color I just was battling figuring out how and so this body work kind of started with as just kind of experiments things that I've had planned for so long and just haven't done it mm -hmm. and so I needed the shift creatively I needed I needed the shift I needed to break from um, what I was doing I was feeling a little bit like I was in a rut and I think this is really exciting I think the potential for it merging kind of this painting mm -hmm. that is what it is actually a ripped up paint painting and with my medium is kind of a really exciting point of departure and I think that there's going to be I feel I'm hoping there's going to be great potential in seeing where it goes So the work that I submitted was U Buguluga Menzi, and um, it speaks about U Shaga Zulu's aunt. Um, Mgaba Igajama is her name. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the story of Mgaba is an interesting one um, because um, she was born a twin, um, and, and in that time, you, you couldn't have twins in a household. One of the twins had to be killed because um, there was a belief that um, if they were both kept alive, they, they would bring bad luck to the whole nation. Um, so essentially what happened was that the king at that time, um, the, the, the twins' fathers decided that no, he'll keep both of the daughters. And it caused a lot of havoc within the nation. It, you know, uh, people were angry because it was unheard of. It, 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 everyone knew that one twin had to go. So, you know, because of that, Mgabai and her sister, her twin sister became, they were hated by the nation and they were treated cruelly growing up. And so from the, from the word go, she's always been, you know, because she was much more outspoken than her sister, she was much more, um, she had a stronger presence or a stronger personality. That people tended to hate her more because they felt that, you know, Mm. there's a dark cloud that's going to come. It's going to come and you will be the cause of that cloud. And indeed what happened was that when she was about six or five, five or six years old, her mother uh, died without having uh, born a son. So now you understand the whole, you know, the, 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 mm. 
kingdom of the Zulu kingdom, you need a son. You need a man in the family to take over once the king dies. And so we're stuck with these twin, twin girls and, you know, we can't do much with them. We need a boy in the, in the family. And so even with the death of their mother, it became the hate towards them became stronger and, you know, towards her specifically um, became stronger because she was, again, the much more assertive one and much more vocal one. Um, so eventually, uh, you know, they grew up, um, the king got another wife, um, and luckily there was a boy that was born, um, who, who then is the father of Ushagazu. And the time that King Jama, their father, passed on, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the son was too young, King Senzangakona, Prince Senzangakona was too young to become the king. Uh, but Umkabai and her sister were old enough, they were probably in their 20s. Um, so, so, you know, they were old enough, but I mean, they were girls, so they, I mean, it became a, a futile exercise, but she demanded that she become regent of the, of the throne. Um, at a time when women had no <laughs> place in, in political affairs, particularly within the Zulu regime. So, you know, she, she was very passionate about what her father did and the fact that he spent both their lives. And so she became committed to, to you know, growing the Zulu kingdom in honor uh, to her father and to say thank you. Um, and she wasn't willing to see the throne go to someone else outside of the family. Uh, which is why she then decided to come forth and be like, I, I'm taking over until such a time my brother is old enough to then become the king. So it was just, you know, from, first of all, I think the first thing that drew, that drew me to the story was drew me to Mugabe's story is the fact that we, we don't know about her. Mm -hmm. And she played such an integral part um, in, in the story of the Zulu nation as a whole. Um, but again, it goes back to this notion of, you know, being being a woman in a space where in a space that's very dominated by men, men um, but also not just being you know having the normal characteristics or you know being a not, not strong is not the word but being a, a woman that probably demonstrates characteristics that may otherwise be labeled as leadership or you know uh, wise or but because she was, she demonstrates or she had characteristics that are primarily or, you know, more aligned with men, she, she became a villain within this whole political uh, space of the Zulu kingdom. Uh, she was hated simply because she was stronger and she demonstrated, you know, she was fast thinking, she was smart and, you know, she, she just wouldn't let things be done anyhow. They, they, you had to really prove your case before she allows you to 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 have it your way mm -hmm. so you know the, even if you read her um, what we call is tagazel her praise names you will see that it, you know she she was she she, she was a, she was a, she was a smart woman she was a brilliant woman but because she was a woman mm -hmm. it, it wasn't taken as as nicely as maybe a man uh, they would have, you know, praised a man mm. um, in terms of when you speak about his talazel or the praise names. Um, she, she was just this sour woman who, you know, no one understood why she was like, why are you not a normal woman? Why are you not quiet and, and you know, sit there in the corner and just allow us men to be men? So I was just drawn to this whole story. But at the same time, um, I don't think the nation of the Zulu nation itself would be where it is if it wasn't for her. But she's not given that respect and you know the um and and the place that she she should have that she deserves uh, given the role that she played i mean there's you, i think that you cannot use imagery of birds without the idea mm -hmm. of kind of flight and freedom and um yeah, freedom. I think that was it definitely played a part in it. I think the idea I was really playing with and the relationship with that and then just 
um, making them a dead bird. All of the, my birds I ever created were always dead. Um, and for me, it, I, I was really just, it was, all my work generally kind of explores ideas through binaries. So construction and deconstruction, life and death. And kind of that, that idea of this kind of idea of freedom and that having, I mean, the, the ultimate no freedom is, well, <laughs> depends on what you believe. <laughs> I mean, death to your death, you know, you can't, uh, um, uh, but then also I used, so the one was the gray one that's hanging from the hook. Uh, mm. That firstly, I, I used it, made it grey referential p pigeon um, because I was dealing with urban environments and spaces, and kind of how we view this pigeon, which is um, actually is a bird and is supposed to be as good and kind of all birds generally symbolise freedom and hope and all these wonderful things. But then the pigeon is also for us what it, they call rats with wings. So that, that kind of dynamic was quite interesting and how much like they have learned to coexist in us in urban environments. And they're one of the only few, the few animals on, uh, like cockroaches and rats that um, have almost thrived in urban spaces. Mm -hmm. So even though humans kind of keep pushing back and it's hanging from this man-made hook. And so that was the, the dynamic of kind of animals and humans and um, and I think for me that was also just kind of because it was all dealing with transients um, yeah I just I was using it as a for oh, sure I made these books quite a long time ago so I am trying to just re remember <laughs> what they were I think my just my choices were um, why did I do it? I think I was trying to... Oh, I've forgotten what I was going to say. Yeah, I think, I think it was just this. And then I've got the other bird with eyes downcast, of course. So the, I, that work... I like the idea of how a bird, like the birds I view, looks at the world from up far, kind of removed from everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, it's kind of the dynamic between the human and animal and man-made and nature, kind of where it uh, collides. So mm -hmm. it's again, symbolic, wonderful freedom and hope and all that. And then man has come in and kind of annihilated it and also how our relationship with that how we try and uh, we've done everything in our power to kind of uh, recreate what the animal the bird has with flying and literally like building airplanes and creating flight um, but then to what end Kind of thing and what is that done it was most of these things are inspired originally inspired by nature and kind of the, the dynamic between where we get all everything and where we hope to be and what we we strive for and then what we harming in the way so again construction and deconstruction 